week, you know that we talked about cupcake wrappers. And like a cupcake wrapper, we can often feel like we've been tossed away, like we're not needed anymore. It can leave us feeling useless, and we can feel like we've been thrown into the trash. We ask the question, where's God when everything goes wrong, and why do bad things happen to people, to us, who are seemingly following him. And we said that God does not make mistakes. He created each and every one of us for a purpose. And even if you've been told your entire life that you aren't good enough and have nothing to offer, that God can take what man has deemed worthless and he can make us new. He can make us whole. He can make us full. Well, I got a lot of good response from that last week. And one of the responses I got was from the Goodwin family who decided to reuse their cupcake wrappers. And so on the right there, Naomi has decided that Barbie or whatever, whatever her name is, it may not be Barbie, I don't know. Um, can can wear a, a cupcake wrapper as a skirt, right? So it got reused. It didn't get thrown away. It got repurposed. And and on the left there, uh, Lizzie has decided that this is a good way to keep her popsicle from melting onto her hand. So what man deemed useless. Naomi and Lizzie decided, I'm going to find a use for the cupcake wrapper. But the question today that I want to wrestle with is, is what now? We can believe that God can take us and make us new. We can believe that. We can think that, we can tell ourselves that, we can hear other people tell us that. We can believe that God has a purpose for us. We can know that, we can hear that, we can be told that. But what part do we play in that process? How do we make that happen? What action can we take to stand firm in this process, when those storms hit. Because it's those storms that often make us feel like that cupcake wrapper. It's the difficult times that often make us feel like we're useless, have no purpose, have been knocked off our feet, have been thrown into the trash. Scripture has a lot to say about that. In fact, I believe the whole story of God is exactly that. What people have said is useless. What Satan hopes is useless. God says, I've got an answer. I've got a way to fix this. And that's what this whole Bible is about. It's a, it's a redemption story. It's restoration. It's understanding whose child we are. I'm going to start today with the story of David and Goliath. And, and we're in our series of the Bible tells me so. And if you haven't been around, that's okay. You've come on a great Sunday. We're going back through stories that if you've grown up in the church, you've heard before, you think you know, you think you understand, and many of you probably do. But even if you've never stepped foot in the church, the term David versus Goliath, you know what that means. You know that means there's an entity that is way too big, way too strong, way too powerful, should never be defeated, 
by another entity that's way too small, way too meek, way too weak, does not possess the arsenal to defeat said large entity. And so we say things like in sporting events, well, this is kind of a David versus Goliath story. And we know what that means. It's the underdog versus the certainty of victory. But see, there's a, the story of David and Goliath. We tend to focus on what happened instead of what precipitated that happening. We know that David grabs five smooth stones. We know that he didn't really need all five of them. He just needed one of them. We know that he went into battle against Goliath, this nine-foot giant who'd been tormenting the Israelite line. It says for 40 days. For 40 days they were in formation and Goliath taunted them. Like at what point, like day 29... Is there a point, why didn't Goliath just go, okay, well, let's just go attack. Or, obviously, nobody's coming out. We don't know why that happened, but for 40 days. So here's David, right? Let's get into David's story just briefly. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I'm going to read verses 20 through 37. Now, something you have to understand about David is David wasn't just meek when it came to he and Goliath. He was viewed as meek and probably even viewed as a cupcake wrapper by his family, by those around him. So let me read this briefly. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd Loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other yet again. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. The difference this time was that David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also, as a little bonus, give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. In other words, we're getting desperate here, right? If anybody can defeat this guy, this guy's driving us crazy, he's embarrassing us. If anybody can defeat him, we'll do all these things for him. David asked the men standing near him, listen to what David asked, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, David goes, why are you people putting up with this? This isn't just a mockery of us as people, he's making a mockery of the living God. And why are you standing here allowing this to happen? Well, verse 27, they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking, heard David speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. And Eliab 
takes that cupcake wrapper that's David and wants to throw him in the trash. With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness, you shepherd? Let me remind everyone around here that you are a shepherd and what you've been asked to do, what you've been told to do, and your place in this world is to tend sheep. Now get away from the battle lines. Then he accuses them of wrong motives and attempts to throw him in the trash. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, as he crumpled up, that cupcake wrapper that's David? You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. This guy's been a warrior since his youth. But David says, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of that Philistine. I imagine that Saul kind of went, well, no one else has stepped up. So he says, go and the Lord be with you. And we know that Saul goes, hey, get him my armor. He's still not good enough. David says, I don't need your armor. It doesn't fit. All it's going to do is cramp my style. I think that's in. (laughs) Maybe. And he defeats that uncircumcised. Philistine. See, David was told he was worthless. But see, David had a foundation. He had a foundation that could not be moved. He knew something about himself that no one else knew until after that uncircumcised Philistine ended up on the ground with a rock in his noggin. And then all of a sudden, everybody wants him to be king. And that's what happens. This is what he knew. Back in chapter 16, You'll remember Samuel's looking for the next king of Israel. And in verse 12, so he sent for him, David, and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said about David, after he'd looked at all the older brothers, the bigger ones, the stronger ones, the tough guys, the Lord said to Samuel about David, rise and anoint him. 
This is the one. This is the one. So all this time in Saul's service, David carries that with him. The world can treat me like a cupcake wrapper, but God has said this is the one. And he says that about every single one of us. Not about being the king of Israel. I don't want that. But he says that to each and every one of our hearts this morning. Imagine God looking at you and saying, this is the one. This is him. This is her. I know he's only eight, but this is the one. This is the one I want. This is the one that has a purpose. This is the one that has a point. This is the one that, that, that in my sight can do what I need them to do. In Matthew <clears throat> chapter 7, we learn about this foundation and why it's so important. Now, this wasn't written about David in response to what happened with Goliath or in response to, to what happened uh, through all his years as the king of Israel. But see, we need to understand something from the New Testament that teaches us what David's foundation was because God desires that that same foundation be our foundation. Chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. David stood because he knew what his foundation was. He did not fall because his foundation was built on the rock. That rock for him was the word of God who said, this is the one. David said, I know who I am in Christ. Well, not Christ, in God. We should be saying, we know who we are in Christ. He said, I know who I am in God, so I don't care what he says or she says or they say or what that giant says. I might as well be going blah, 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 because I hear God's voice saying, this is the one. Therefore, I will act on what God says and not what they say. And Jesus says in this passage, we should do the same thing. See, he just finishes, this is the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. Verses 5, or chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, you can go back through and read all the things that he says. But it's the final words that he says. He closes this entire discourse with these words. Basically saying, if you will build your life on these words that I have just said, you will have a solid foundation on which to build your house. And that house will stand no matter what storms come. But if you hear these words of mine and all you do is hear them or memorize them or talk about them in Bible study or discuss them with your Christian friends, but don't do anything with them, I'm telling you, your house will come crashing down when the storms of life come. 
Now, that was no knock on Bible study. By the way, fill out your surveys about the Bible study. But see, the point of our study of God's Word should never be just recall or knowledge or, oh, look how much I know. It should always be with the intent of making those words the foundation for how we live our life, how we take each step every day. So the house represents our lives. The houses are our lives. The houses in this story, there's two houses. The houses are exactly the same. One man was wise. One man was foolish. They built the same house. And so my question for you is what are you building with your life. See, we're all building something. Every one of us are building something. Even if you're lazy and sitting back doing nothing, you're building something. You're building laziness is what you're building. It's like parenting. You're parenting all the time, whether you're active or not. If you are an inactive parent, you're still building something into your kids. Because they're watching you. And they're learning from your inactivity. So you're building something. The houses are our lives. What are you building with your life? I had a conversation recently with a friend uh, who's actually here. <laughs> part of this church. And I asked him, I, I said, I'm not going to tell you. I mean, it's, it doesn't matter. It's Darren back there. <laughs> but I said, Darren, and this was a very serious conversation, and I said, do you ever sit around and go, what am I doing? And Darren's like, yeah, yes. What am I doing? What, like, I look around and I go, what am I doing? And as a church, I ask the question, what are we doing? Are we doing anything or, or are we just going through motions? Is that what I'm doing with my life is just going through the motions? I think every once in a while, and, and I, I think maybe this is really especially a middle-aged guy thing, like that whole midlife crisis, you have to take a step back and just go, what in the world am I doing? And it makes us go, it, it's an evaluation process, right? Okay, it's not a negative thing. It's, it makes us go, okay, what am I doing? Okay, I'm not doing what I want to do. How do I make changes and do what I want to do? But we are each building a life. And our lives are being built on a foundation. And my question for you is, what is your house built upon? What is your life? built upon. You can't build a house in midair. It can't happen. It has to sit on something. There's a foundation somewhere. No matter if you intentionally poured your foundation or found your foundation, your house is sitting on something. Your life is sitting on something. What is your life built upon? That foundation for our life is whatever teaching, doctrine, philosophy, paradigm, whatever, whatever we subscribe to. That's our foundation. If you don't know what your foundation is, think about the things that motivate you. That's probably what your life is built upon. Think about the things that make you happy. That's probably what you're building your life on. Now the question is, are the things that motivate you and the things that make you happy, are they the things of God? Foundation is important, but we all have a foundation that we build our life upon. And God lets us choose what that foundation is. That's the great thing about God and the curse to our own ability to make good decisions. Is he lets us pick. 
what we build our life upon. See, some of us choose a foundation of money and what makes us happy and what motivates us is money, money, money. Stuff, stuff, stuff. And we spend our existence trying to get as much as we possibly can. For some of us, it's our career. And we build our life upon that career, our very existence, our, 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 our very personal satisfaction comes from our career. And that's why it's so devastating for some when that career comes to an abrupt end. It's because we've based our entire existence on that career and we've built our life on that career. For some of us, it's making other people happy and not in a good way. In the sense that I'm going to allow everyone else to dictate what I do because I've just got to make everybody happy. And we walk around living our lives and building our lives upon the desire to make everyone around us happy. And we cater to that. There's some people in this room that say, if I could only find that perfect person my life would be fine. And we build our life upon that. If only, if only, if only you fill in the blank. The key is, though, these storms are going to come. And when we get knocked off of our foundation, guess whose fault it's not? The storm. Hear that. It's not the storm's fault when the lives that we've built get knocked off its foundation. The storms just come. The wind blows wherever it pleases. It's not the storm's fault. The problem is we like to blame the storm. We like to blame the other people that made this happen. It's their fault, their fault, their fault. It's always somebody else's fault. It's not the storm's fault. In fact, C.S. Lewis says, in regard to things that kind of knock us off our feet, he says, surely what a man does when he is taking off, taken off his guard is the best evidence for what sort of man he is. The suddenness of the provocation does not make me ill-tempered. It only shows me what an ill-tempered man I am. In other words, it's not the storm's fault. I respond based on who I am. And let me remind you who God says you are. He says, this is the one. And can't we build our lives on that? On God's words that say, you're the one. You're the one. Those of us that are in happy relationships, the fact that the one we're with said, you're the one, man, that's a foundation that I can build a marriage on. Your good friends, the fact that they said, yeah, you're the one I want to be my best friend. Now, not that anybody talks like that. But they chose you. And that can be a foundation for a relationship that can last through the storms, through the fire. So the question is, will your house stand when those storms come? And it literally is when those storms come. The storms are the things which threaten the lives we are building and which test the strength of that foundation. They can threaten our physical, emotional, our spiritual well-being. The storms are going to come. Is the life you're building going to stand? And what determines that is the foundation that that life is built 
upon. Anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, puts them into practice. These words of mine, these truths that are taught by Jesus, when they're put into practice, they can be a foundation upon which we can build a life that will withstand any storm. A worship team is going to come and close us out. I'm going to remind you, last week I said these words. I said that God is not nearly as concerned with our comfort in this world as he is our commitment to him. Does that commitment rest on the solid, the rock solid foundation of God's words, of Jesus' words, of God's ways? Or does it rest on something else that we've decided maybe is a little bit more important? Or is this just a little bit easier at the time, right? People, it's easy to build a life based on success. It's easy to build a life based on finding the right person. I mean, that, that's, that's easy. It's easy to build a life based on how much money can I make? How can I look in front of other people? How much power can I get a hold of? That's easy. But it's shifting sand. That's all it is. Because when the storms come, it knocks our lives right off of that foundation because it's just a foundation that is worthless. It's pointless. So I challenge you to ask this question to yourself right now, this week. What am I doing? Build them upon my ways, upon my words, and your house will.